In this video, we're going to take a look at the periodic trends of atomic radius and ionic radius. So let's start with first defining what atomic radius is. So the atomic radius is formally defined as the half of the distance between two nuclei of the same atoms that are bonded together. So what this looks like in a picture is if we had, say, two chlorine atoms that are bonded together, we would take the distance between the two nuclei and then take half of that, and that would be the atomic radius. And the reason why we do this is because our atomic model makes it pretty unfeasible to measure the distance from the center of the atom to the edge of its electron cloud because we don't actually know where that edge is for sure. Okay, so um, this is sort of the definition that we're working from for atomic radius. Now, if we take a look at the trends in atomic radius across the periodic table, if we first take a look across a period, then it increases from right to left or it decreases from left to right. And then atomic radius increases as we go down a period, or sorry, down a group in the periodic table. Now, in order to be able to explain these trends, we first need to define a couple of other terms. And those two terms are effective nuclear charge and shielding. So first we need to kind of talk about shielding. So if we have an atom then we know that the negatively charged electrons are attracted to the positively charged nucleus. But we also need to keep in mind that the valence electrons are also repelled by the other electrons in the atom. So we've got some different attractions and repulsions going on in our particular atom. Also, the core electrons in the inner or non-valent shells will reduce the positive charge that's being experienced by the valence electrons. So there's a variety of different sort of um, attractions and repulsions going on here. So shielding then is defined as the effect of reducing the nuclear charge experienced by an electron. So we would say that those outer electrons in this picture, those two electrons are shielded um, because we've got those inner electrons that are reducing the overall nuclear charge that's being experienced by those valence electrons. We can also define something called effective nuclear charge and this is the net charge that's experienced by an electron. We can do a really crude uh, calculation for this. It's not by any means exact, but we could take and calculate that the effective nuclear charge, or ZEF, F, is approximately equal to Z, which is the atomic number, minus S, which is the number of electrons that are being shielded by, by our, uh, our atoms. So for example, if we took magnesium, magnesium has an atomic number of 12. And in this particular picture, we've got 10 electrons that are inside. So 12 minus 10 would give it an effective nuclear charge of approximately two. Okay, but this, remember, this calculation is not exact. All right, so now that we have those terms, we can, we can go in and we can describe why atomic radius increases down a group, group and decreases across a period. Let's first at atomic radi look at atomic radius increasing down a group. So as we go down a group, in each new period, the outer shell electrons or valence electrons enter a new energy level. So they're located further away from the nucleus. If we look at lithium, for example, we have two main energy levels. Sodium has three and potassium has four. So those valence electrons are going further and further away from the nucleus. Now this has a greater effect than the increasing nuclear charge or Z. Uh, because of shielding by the core electrons. So 
because we're increasing the energy levels, that's going to have the bigger effect here. Now, if we took a, take a look at atomic radius going across the period from left to right, it decreases. And this is because the effective nuclear charge increases as we go across a period from left to right. And that's going to pull the valence electrons closer to the nucleus, which reduces the atomic radius. So if we take a look at lithium, lithium has two main energy levels, has an atomic number of three, and so its effective nuclear charge is three, and then we have two electrons in the inner shells and one electron in the outer shell. So three minus two gives us an effective nuclear charge of about one. Whereas if we look at beryllium, it's now atomic number four, two inner electrons, two in the valence shell. So four minus two is going to give us an effective nuclear charge of two. So it's increasing as we go across the period, which is going to then pull the valence electrons closer to the nucleus, reducing the atomic radius. If we take a look then at cations or anions, so the ionic radius, um, ionic radius is measured the same sort of way, um, but we're looking now at ions versus looking at just a neutral atom. For cations, the radii of cations, so these are our positively charged ions, are always smaller than those of the parent atoms. So if we look at sodium, it's got an atomic or a atomic radius of 0.186 nanometers. And if we look at the ionic radius of sodium, it's 0 0.098. And that's because there are more protons than electrons in the cation. So the valence electrons are more strongly attracted to the nucleus. If we look at anions, though, we get the opposite sort of effect. So a atomic radius of chlorine is 0 0.099 nanometers versus the chloride ion is 0 0.181 nanometers. So whenever we have anions or negatively charged ions, they're actually larger than their parent atoms. And that's because the extra electrons in the anion result in greater repulsion between the valence electrons. So that increases the radius of those ions. All right, so that's it for this video. That's both the atomic radii as well as the ionic radii and their general trends in the periodic table. Now let's move on to our next task.